Hi everybody. Uh, because we're doing something a little different this week, uh, I wanted to provide a brief lecture for you. I know we're used to lecturing class, but doing it this format will allow us to uh, free up our time to do some more engaging activities in class. So uh, I hope you have an opportunity to view this. I'm going to try to keep it to under 15 minutes. So with that in mind, here we go. Um, we're talking about urbanization and the growth of cities in the United States and all the different effects that that's going to have. And I just wanted to throw this up real quick to give you an idea of just how quickly states grew and um, how it illustrates some other things that we study. Like I find this very interesting. If you look at Chicago here, uh, in 1860, there's a little over 100,000 people in Chicago. Now, in 1860 in New York, there's over a million, and, and that, that number is going to uh, more than double uh, in 40 years. But look at the dramatic increase in Chicago and, and these other Western cities as well. Um, it really illustrates the whole idea of, of some of the things that we talked about in the last chapter, especially regarding Frederick Jackson Turner and, and the rise of the West. Now, sometimes we study history and we're like, well, this is what happened and this is chapter 18 and, and here we go. Uh, but sometimes I think we lose track that really when we talk about the growth of urbanization, we're really talking about something that's continuing today. Um, today, 80% of the population lives in urban areas. And in many ways, this is a continuation of this time period, a continuation of the turn of the century. And what some people predict is that, you know, in the near future, we're going to have these megalopolises where these big cities and their suburbs are really connected. And just kind of a cool idea of, of how history isn't really an isolated thing that happens in chapters, but it, it's oftentimes uh, a snapshot of something that continues into today. Dumbbell tenements. With the growth of populations in cities, there were pragmatic questions as to what to do with these people. What are we going to do? Where are we going to put them? The sanitation, the jobs, uh, the housing. One attempt at dealing with this massive influx of people into the cities were these tenements. Now, the term tenement today, I think, carries with it a negative connotation, but originally it wasn't seen in a negative way. It was, it was an attempt to provide low-cost housing to a lot of different people. Uh, dumbbell tenements became very popular. I don't know if you can see the shape here. They kind of look like a dumbbell uh, if you uh, manipulate the drawing just a little bit. And you can see, and we're going to look at some famous uh, photographs done by Jacob Rees later in the presentation, you can see how these uh, tenements in these rooms could really be filled to the brim with people and the issues that that would carry in terms of sanitation, crime, uh, and a myriad of other things that affected the cities during this time period. Here's a, a bigger image of it. And these were primarily made of wood. So you can imagine one fire in, in one of these buildings, one of these rooms, and this whole thing would, would light up. Uh, tenements became very dangerous places in the cities. Hence, uh, a fire. This is a photograph of just that happening. And here's another photograph that, you know, I think uh, if you have a heart, I don't know how you don't look at this and, and have a, a sad moment. Uh, the orphans sleeping above the church. Uh, there were many orphans created because of these squalid conditions in the cities. Um, growth of immigration. Uh, when we talk about the cities, I think I'll get rid of this pointer option real quick. Uh, when we talk about the cities uh, and the growth in the cities, a lot of this growth came from immigration. And why did people come to America? Earlier in the year, we talked about the three G's, uh, God, gold, and government. Uh, that was true in the 1500s and the 1600s and the 1700s, and it's true in the 1800s. It's probably true today. Why do people come to America? Um, during this time period, uh, the reasons that people came to America were varied. Some of it had to do with economic issues. Uh, some of it dealt with religious persecution political and, and the desire for religious freedom. Uh, some of it dealt with an opportunity to come here was a little bit more affordable. The low-cost steerage, as it was called, uh, you could buy a ticket on a, on a boat for a fairly affordable price. Um, 
this is going to have a lot to do with not only the growth of immigration, but the growth of cities. Real quick, I just wanted to make a comment. One of the benefits of doing a presentation like this is that you can pause it, and if you'd like to take notes, uh, you can pause it and get the notes right off of here. The notes are also posted on my Moodle, for those of you who want to go and get them uh, from that. I wanted to start with this political cartoon, and it's interesting that this political cartoon is 1880. This political cartoon you can interpret for yourself, but obviously I think this is a pro-immigration cartoon, that uh, they're espousing the benefits of America, no oppressive taxes, no expensive kings, no compulsory military service, free education, free land, a little nod to the Homestead Act, free speech, free ballot, free lunch, that this is a very positive political cartoon extolling you know, the virtues of immigration. 1880 is an interesting year uh, in that I think we're going to see that this attitude in America is going to be very different in, in the years following 1880. That in mind, oftentimes we divide immigrants into two groups, old immigrants and new immigrants. Old immigrants, this is kind of an arbitrary term, but I think it, it's worth noting that 1875 was the first time that an immigration law was passed in the United States. So before 1875, there really wasn't too much negative uh, feelings about immigrants. Uh, immigrants, for the most part, were from Northern and Western Europe. The vast majority would be from England. They were Protestant. They were English speaking. They were literate. They could read and write English. And they had marketable skills. Um, sometimes when we think of, of people who've been here for a long time, uh, they might refer to them as, as wasps. Uh, that term, I think, has been used in a negative way by a lot of people, but literally it means white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Uh, they're white, they're Anglo-Saxon, they're from uh, Northwestern Europe, and they're Protestant. This group of immigrants were, are, are referred to as old immigrants. They're going to be replaced by new immigrants. Again, this is somewhat of an arbitrary date, uh, but 1875 seems to work. And the new immigrants are going to come from Southern Eastern Europe. Italy, so uh, Russia, I just said the Soviet Union by accident, Russia, uh, Greece, they're going to be non-Protestants. They're going to be Roman Catholic, Jewish, Greek Orthodox. They're going to suffer a lot of discrimination for that. They're poor. They're, they don't have skills. They come to America with far less uh, money in their pockets. Uh, and sometimes when we talk about immigrants, I, oops, sorry about that. Uh, and we talk about new immigrants, we talk about the discrimination that they suffered. And some of the discrimination that they're going to suffer from is going to be uh, discrimination that's geared towards their social differences, religion, language, which I find so interesting when we talk about immigration today. Uh, a lot of prejudice or discrimination that new immigrants face today are for the same reasons. When we look at immigration, some find it interesting to look at immigration in two different ways. There's this salad bowl theory. Uh, sometimes referred to as cultural pluralism, and there's the melting pot theory, which most of you have probably heard of before. The idea between salad bowl theory or cultural pluralism is that when new immigrants come to America, they mix with everyone else. But like a salad bowl, you can still pick out the tomatoes, you can still pick out the cucumbers and the lettuce. Like a salad bowl, they retain their individual cultural identity. And maybe that cultural identity uh, has a place in American society. We think of St. Patrick's Day, for example, or Columbus Day, or you know, uh, Cinco de Mayo, uh, to name a few. Uh, but these new immigrants retain, retain a strong sense of cultural identity. Melting pot theory, on the other hand, uh, puts forth this idea that there's a mixture of cultures and, and like what happens with the melting pot, they no longer retain a cultural identity, but a new identity is created from a mixture of these different cultures. There's no right answer. It's just an interesting way of looking at, at immigration from two different perspectives. There is a long, long history of anti-immigration feelings in America in the 1850s to kind of start out with. Uh, there's the Know Nothing Party. I found this particularly offensive cartoon uh, just to illustrate these attitudes, this person over here would be an Irish immigrant who's drawn in a horribly uh, degrading way, almost like a monkey. Irish people were sometimes referred to as white apes, uh, obviously in a negative way. 
This is a Chinese immigrant, again, drawn in, in a horribly stereotypical, racist way. And what they're doing here, this is kind of a gross cartoon, right? They're swallowing Uncle Sam. And of course, at the end, America is becoming this, in, in the eyes of this cartoonist, a horrible mix of Irish and Chinese. It just illustrates the term nativism, which we're going to talk about. Nativism is this idea that people who are native-born Americans were against new immigrants. And we see this continue in, in American history. It becomes very prevalent with the arrival of these new immigrants. It becomes very popular in the 1920s, the KKK. This image is from the 1920s. And I, I think there's a high degree of nativism today in America. Uh, it's a, a political discussion, but I, I don't think many people would, degree, would disagree with that. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Chinese Americans uh, who came here to originally work on the railroad, this cartoon kind of illustrates that, were uh, after the railroad was built, there was a tremendous amount of discrimination against them and a lot of people wanted less Chinese Americans uh, around, uh, hence the Chinese Exclusion Act. This cartoon illustrates some of the treatment of Chinese Americans. Uh, it wasn't uncommon for Chinese Americans to be the subject of abuse, their ponytails being cut off, and that was uh, you know, a particularly degrading thing to, to have happen to them. Jumping ahead a little bit, I always like to point out that this is, you know, a few decades later, but jumping ahead when Teddy Roosevelt was president, the Gentleman's Agreement pat was passed. And the Gentleman's Agreement was an unofficial agreement between the United States and Japan that limited immigration between them. And we see a degree of racism in that there's a special focus against Asian immigrants uh, during this time period but certainly not the only uh, discrimination. We're gonna talk about other groups that were discriminated against as well. With that in mind, there's a series of laws that are passed that try to dissuade uh, new immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe coming. Uh, they're all very similar in nature. The Emergency Quota Act of 1921 is the first of these laws. And I just think this is a great chart um, that kind of illustrates that. You have uh, the numbers before, and you can see, between 1907 and 1914, uh, you can read it for yourself, but most of the immigrants are coming from Southern and Eastern Europe. 1921, you have the first quota act. It was effective, I mean, greatly effective, but not as effective as most people uh, who supported uh, immigration reform would have liked. And 1924, uh, you have the Emergency Quota Act of 1924, which was amended to be even stricter. You can see how effective these two laws were, the National Origins Act. These quota acts, you know, much like a quota, I think when we hear the word quota today, we might be at the supermarket and it might say um, good sale on soup and it might say quota four cans of soup per customer. Uh, quota acts put a quota on how many people could come from certain countries. So it limited the number of immigrants from Southern and Eastern European countries and allowed more immigrants to come from uh, Northern and Western Europe. Uh, they used current uh, demographics in America to kind of come up with these numbers. And obviously there were more Americans from Northern and Western Europe, so the quotas for those countries were higher. It was a veiled attempt at limiting uh, immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, it wasn't a veiled attempt, but it was veiled to the veiled uh, racism behind it. I find it particularly interesting that in 1924, when they amended the Quota Act and really made it much more severe, is the same year that the Statue of Liberty was uh, commissioned as a, as a national monument. Uh, that hypocrisy, uh, I just find so fascinating. This cartoon, I, I think of that first cartoon that we had. This cartoon, we've kind of come full circle. In the first cartoon in 1880, the immigrants are, are uh, Uncle Sam is there with his hands welcoming the immigrants. And here, they have their hands up saying, stop. What some students don't notice, most do, is that these men are casting shadows that do not reflect themselves. They reflect the immigrants, the immigrant families that they uh, come from. And kind of reveals the hypocrisy of some of these attitudes. Um, impact of urbanization. Uh, all of these people come into America, and we have crime, uh, uh, not America, cities. We have crime and corruption, overcrowding, sanitation issues. Uh, we also have some social things that come up like desire for public parks and increased market for recreation, sports, amusement parks, shows, uh, 
all the rest.